All rise. Thank you, Nate District Court, the College of Washington, the State of Michigan. No, I said, I want to do something. Maybe seated. All right, we're back on the record in the case of the people versus Isaiah Williams. Council is present. Good for argument and a motion. I got everything hooked up. I think it's um thank you. <laughs> the HMI court is closing it. Sorry, just a second. Could have done so how does she not have any icons on her? Do you know that? That's not my screen. Oh, <laughs> my, my bad. <laughs> I, oh, my like, how do you get through life? You don't get there is nothing to click on. <laughs> I was going to say, my father, that's right. <laughs> Everything's there. So, who are we watching then? Um, it's just been that kind of day. <laughs> That's my right, correct? That is the right law table. Yep. But I <laughs> it should broadcast. Yeah, and normally it goes black on. There, oh, there, there she is. No. Oh, you had to turn hers to the start. Gotcha. It doesn't have to be every time. All right. Well, it's it's never, <laughs> it has never happened to me. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dutch. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> and I think that the game case is clear. Circumstantial evidence and reasonable inferences is what we're talking about here. And it's very appropriate for the court to make those reasonable inferences from the evidence that we have. And I think that it's a very common misconception that you need a body for a murder case. And I, I'm saying that to Mr. Williams too, wherever he's listening, because that is that is a very common misconception all across the state. Um, let's talk a little bit about Elisa Williams. She was born August 10th, 1981. The defendant, Isaiah Williams, is her legal father, not her biological father, based on the testimony and evidence we have. She was taken on or about April 29, 1982. She was last seen in July in the summer by multiple people in 1982 in Ann Arbor, in Michigan, in Washtenaw County. She has not been seen as of Saturday, as of this past Saturday, in 41 years. The evidence points to murder, that she was murdered in July. He left to go to Alabama at the end of July. She was last seen in the beginning of July. He did not have her when he left the state. There is probable cause that she is deceased, that she did not die of natural causes, that she died from a homicide, and that the homicide was committed by the defendant. This is one of the exhibits that was admitted. This is what decades later, Alyssa Williams would look like had she been alive, but she is not alive. The evidence points to her being very much deceased, Your Honor. Um, we are asking for a bind over on count one, the only count charged here, open murder, that Mr. Williams did murder Alyssa Williams. There is no degree that is required here under open murder. No evidence of premeditation, no deliberation required under the case law. But of course, motive is always relevant. That's why the other acts here, especially the other acts on Denise Frazier Daniel are so important. And I would submit they're not even other acts when it comes to Denise Frazier Daniel. They are part of the case in chief. They are evidence of defendant's motive, his opportunity, his premeditation, and his deliberation, even though that is not something we have to prove at this stage. Um, the case law is clear. There's prior threats, prior feelings of ill will, that deliberate action on the part of a defendant, that is premeditation. Evidence of marital discord, either known to the defendant's spouse or showing the state of mind is sufficient case. That was all things that came in under Denise Frazier Daniel's testimony in this case. Corpus delecti, we don't have any corpus delecti issues, even with the lack of a body. There's no corpus delecti in using this multiple statements that we've put in from the defendant. His admissions, his confessions, they are all admissible. We have circumstantial evidence of a death that was the result of a criminal act or an agency. That's the McMahon case. A body is not necessary. Again, people be Williams and people be Moldeski. Testimony of a medical examiner is not even essential or required. Whether, well, where there is competent and substantial other evidence of unnatural death or injury. Venue. 
The people early on in this case designated and filed documents to designate a venue here in Washtenaw County. Um, that was under MCL 762.3. Um, but let's look at the totality of circumstances that we have on this evidence. Look at the court documents that have all been admitted. Isaiah Williams, through his family court attorney, said, I temporarily, li temporarily lived on Pittsfield in Ann Arbor at a motel in Ann Arbor. There was attached copies of a driver's license with prior Ann Arbor addresses. The testimony of him in family court was that he had her in Washtenaw County in Ann Arbor uh, in the Island Park when she quote unquote disappeared or allegedly was abducted. This, as I submit to this court, this false abduction story. Testimony that um, from Elizabeth Reese that she was seen at a hospital in Ann Arbor and at her house. Again, we have multiple, multiple pieces of evidence that points to not only him having her in the venue of Ann Arbor or venues in Washington County, but that's where he killed her. That is where he killed her and ultimate, ultimately where she met her demise. A couple cases I do want to talk about unpublished case law here in the state of Michigan upholding no body cases. In People v. Green, the Court of Appeals affirmed a first-degree murder conviction with the body of the 13-year-old victim there was never found. Uh, the victim was to meet the defendant there under false pretenses. She was last seen at a meeting place. There was a white van there. The evidence was that the defendant later replaced a white van that he had and got rid of some self and some phone records he had. He denied knowing the victim in this case, then later admitted to a particular person that he knew where the body was, although the body was never recovered. He kept a picture of her. He admitted he had a fetish for 13 and 14 year old girls. And he admitted to an inmate awaiting trial that he was going to trial because he quote killed a girl. We know that Isaiah Williams um, telling multiple stories, but he has told multiple people that he killed this child. People v. Phillips, the Court of Appeals also affirmed this second degree murder conviction. This is a very, very similar case to ours, Your Honor. A body of a four month old never found. The defendant sent the victim's mother a letter in the case that uh, the child was now at peace and the child was thrown from a car seat. And that's how she died. An inmate uh, there, also an inmate, where, uh, said the defendant was bragging that he wouldn't be charged with murder because they'd never find the body. Again, think back to Mary Leslie Bryant's testimony. They never found the body and it killed the baby. It's very similar to our case, both in that regards and the fact that in the Phillips case, he had a very tumultuous and violent relationship with the victim's mother. And the defendant was not the biological father of the victim in that case. That is a direct parallel to this, the, that lethality factor, that tactic that we have, that issue we have um, based on the expert testimony of Holly Rosen. All the evidence that we have, and I'm going to talk specifically some of, about some of it. The fact is, he is the last person that is seen ever with Elisa Williams alive. He makes multiple inconsistent statements. He makes false exculpatory statements, and I'm going to talk specifically about those. The false abduction story and the closed head injury. Those are false exculpatory statements. Court can also look and make reasonable inferences in this consciousness of guilt, right? Inferences based on his conduct, his behaviors, and his statements. Gleaning from those things, reasonable inferences of the defendant's guilt. The timeline and taking of this child. His fleeing to Alabama. That is going to be a question of fact for the jury based on the jury charge. Did he flee to Alabama or did he go there for a job? I'm submitting to you he fled to Alabama after he killed this child. Elisa was a healthy child. Denise was the primary caregiver. He, she would be soiled and dirty when she left with her. Elizabeth reset when she brought him over. She was soiled and dirty. He was not the primary caregiver for this child. She has been gone as of Saturday for 41 years. And the other acts evidence, the substantial violent propensity towards women and children violence that we have here. And we're going to talk about that. Last person to see, be seen with Olisa. Elizabeth Reese saw her at the hospital in Ann Arbor multiple times, then at her house. He then, at the end of July, takes the defendant to the bus station. No luggage, no Alyssa. The defendant resided in the state of Ohio. Her, her, his mother was sick and dying, based on the testimony of Liz Reese, and it was dead by September, by her funeral, September 2nd. Why did Isaiah Williams suddenly flee to Alabama with no luggage and no child? I would submit to the court because he had killed the child at that point. 
Verna Williams Anderson and Kimberly Webb are her children, her children with the defendant. They also saw that child at the house. None of these people, none of these women ever saw that child again in 41 years after the defendant left that home with that child. We're talking early July, July 9th or 10th, a couple of weeks before Verna's birthday, July 22nd, when the defendant goes to Alabama. So within a couple of weeks, she's gone, never to be seen again. Betty Peters also saw the child in the state of Michigan in Washtenaw County. She was a nurse for U of M Hospital. She also saw the child with her brother, the defendant, never saw the child again. The defendant has told Denise, as well as other parties, Elisa died of a fever. That was disputed by Denise checking all the local hospitals, no record of her child dying of a fever. I gave Elisa away. That you heard from Detective Iverson that was looked into multiple ways in the investigation. Hundreds and hundreds of tips. Nobody's ever come forward with Elisa. Elisa's across the water. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but nothing really came from that. Elisa was taken from a park while I slept. This is one of those false exculpatory statements. His, the legal father who's caring for this child, she was abducted from your car and you never reported it to the police. That is inconceivable. I think it was Molly Reno that said this was incredulous. Um, and then I killed Elisa. And he said this multiple times, multiple times to police. He admitted he said this to Elizabeth Reese. He said, I told Denise this. I was just trying to torture her or mess with her. I forgot what the exact language was. Uh, but he also made this specific threat to Elizabeth. I killed a woman. I killed a baby. They never found the body. And he's doing this while he's strangling her. And he's telling her, I will kill you too. More statements that he made. Think back to that September 1982 uh, assault at the Motel City of on Denise. Come meet me and I'll tell you where Elisa is. He has no intention of turning over that child. That child's gone by September of 1982. The charging date on the information, or on the complaint rather, is the year 1982. But I'm submitting to the court by September of 82 that child is gone. Give me money and I'll give Elisa back. Many witnesses testified money is an impetus, jealousy is an impetus for violence. Many things are an impetus for violence for this man. But that set him off to a violent assault where she had to jump from a second story window to get away. His admissions of guilt are huge here, Judge. He told Denise he killed Elisa, he told Mary he killed a baby. She didn't think anything of it except her life was being threatened. She didn't even know he had children at that point. And then he threatened Elizabeth regarding her grandmother ending up like that baby. False exculpatory statements. And the case law is pretty clear on this judge. There's got to be, you know, at least a record. And I think we did very much make more than probable cause of a record here that the statements that he made are false in some way, even by a circumstantial nature that's a false in some way. This Island Park abduction story is false. His close head injury and lack of memory, whether you are to understand it by poisoning, car accident, or a chip implanted in his head, which I've known he said to you several times, Judge, throughout these proceedings, he has said them several times, that those are racist memories. We have to look at the totality of the circumstances, whether the statements are false under people who Jackson. The testimony at court as evidence of false statements, that's the Wackerly case. You will see from those court documents, and I know the court reviewed the exhibits already, yeah. there was a February 1st, 1983 contempt proceeding where this man testified on the record about this false abduction story. Judge Ross Campbell subsequently put him in jail for contempt of court. That tells you about the credibility of that statement. Um, and you can use that as substantive evidence of guilt on Swaggardly and the Dandridge case. Consciousness of guilt. Inference of, of incrimination gleaned from the words and actions of the defendant. So we've got many different versions of what happened to Alyssa. If you gave her away, stick to that story. If she died of a fever, take us to the hospital where she's at and have a funeral for her. Why are the stories com continually uh, changing? That is the inference of incrimination. The abduction story that was never reported. The admission of Elisa uh, that he killed her and made her body disappear. The false statements to Elizabeth about Denise, right? Where's Denise, Elizabeth asks. Oh, she's she's in Ohio. She's here. She's here. It's fine. We know when he goes to Alabama, he tells Elizabeth Denise has her. But we know Denise did not have that baby at that time. That's another consciousness of guilt. Where's the baby? Elisa Williams is deceased at that point. 
He fled to Alabama in July of 82. He did not have a Lisa with him. Why did he flee? Talk about that. His story about not having any memory and his multiple reasons why he can't even keep track of how many versions about why he doesn't have a memory. What I'm going to submit to the court is he kept telling people one version. Then he told people the abduction story, but it was so ridiculous. It's so over the top that he realized nobody was believing that, not his siblings that he was telling, not his children, not his ex-wife, that suddenly it dawned on him when he went to prison in 1984 for abusing Elizabeth Reese. memory. I'm going to just shut it down by saying I don't remember what happened. I don't know her. I don't know you. I don't know me. The fleeing to Alabama. So he brings Elisa to, to Elizabeth and her daughters in early July, 9th or 10th. By the end of July, the day after Verna's birthday, birthday, he's suddenly on a bus to Alabama. The testimony of Elizabeth supports that, and the statements in the affidavits, all in the court documents, they are purporting to be statements of the defendant, affidavits filed by his attorney. He resided in Ohio. His mother, Elizabeth Reese, said he was very close to his mother. Why is he leaving right then when his mother is dying? He is, they have no knowledge of close family in Alabama, not Sandy Peters, not Elizabeth Reese, not Denise. And then Detective Iverson followed up on that. Nobody in Alabama had that child. Nobody was close enough for him to give that child to. And he didn't have her when he got on that bus. He didn't even have luggage. Why would he suddenly up and leave to Alabama? She was killed before he left. He only came back to Michigan because his beloved mother died and he had to attend her funeral. I would submit to the court that's the only reason he returned to Michigan where he killed Alyssa. And let's look at the criminal jury instruction 4.4. And again, this is going to be a question of fact. Should this be bound over for the jury? There's evidence that the defendant either tried to rot, run, hide, did run and hide. Um, that could be innocent, right? We all know that to be for innocent reasons. Could he have gotten a job there? The evidence supports that he did not get a job there based on Detective Iverson's testimony um, and all the circumstantial evidence. But a person may also run or hide because of consciousness of guilt. That's what I submit to the court we have here, a consciousness of guilt. He took off after killing Alyssa. Alyssa before was a healthy child. You saw the immunization card. She was up to date on her immunizations. Denise was the primary caregiver. You, as, as the judge presiding here, can look at the credibility of Denise Frazier Daniel on whether she was a good primary caregiver for that child. She was eight months old when she was taken, completely dependent on the care of the defendant who took her from her mother's arms. We are not talking about a 25-year-old woman who decided to go off to Europe and start a new life. This is a baby who is completely dependent on that man and who he to, who last had custody and control of that child. She did not go off and start a new life. He killed her. It has been 41 years. Look at the timing. Timing of the taking of the child in conjunction with the testimony, the general testimony of Holly Rosen. Denise had already tried to divorce the defendant one time before. That document is in evidence. It was dismissed because the defendant could not be found to be served. Denise had already moved out. She was leaving him. She said she was intending on divorcing him. She lived with uh, Diane Taylor. The defendant had assaulted her the day before and locked her in the closet and would not let her out. CPS had to get involved because she couldn't even get back to Elisa. He was losing control of her. He takes her to punish Denise, to control Denise, to torture Denise. Uh, did he premeditate the killing at the time he took her? I don't think the court even has to look at that. He took it to control her because he wasn't controlling Denise anymore. He flees to Michigan where Denise fo follows him with filing for legal separation and to gain custody of, of Alyssa. So now he flees, and by June, she's there filing documents to tell him, I don't care what you've done. I'm still leaving you, and I'm taking my kid. It's at that point that he's probably thinking about child support, and the, which we know is a hot button issue with him based on the testimony. And that sets him off. He has to get rid of this child. And quickly, the timeline, and I won't focus on this too much, or he's really paid very close attention to testimony. Um, but that's, let's look at back in Ohio, April 29th, 1982. She's last seen in June, July of 82 in the state of Michigan. By the end of July, he's gone in Alabama and not back here until September. 
She was killed here in the state of Michigan. The evidence points to it happening here in Washington County. The suspect claims this claim, this supposed head injury, I would say that there's absolutely no evidence to that. The other acts, Your Honor, this is an open murder case, yes. This is an open murder charge, yes. But make no mistake about it, it is a domestic violence case. This was his legal child, which he shared a residence with, he shared a home with. That is a domestic violence case and that falls within the domestic violence definition, causing, attempting harm, whether it's physical or mental to a family member or a household member. Um, that is sexual assault, which we heard from Barry Leslie Bryant, um, terrorizing, threatening, intimidating. We heard that from multiple witnesses, but this is physical harm to his family members, the DB case. Denise's other acts show specific evidence of premeditation, deliberation, motive, and intent here. Um, and the statute in which all this evidence comes in under, along with the prop case, which is the seminal case out of this, Montgomery, Brandon, et cetera, is that this man had a propensity. We can use it for propensity. He had a propensity of violence against not only women, but partners. And Kimberly, we know that the evidence is that he admitted to losing it because his child was crying and pushing her down the stairs, causing multiple broken bones. So we've got abuse on Denise, Elizabeth, Mary, and Kimberly. All of these acts happened before, contemporaneous to, and even at, after the kidnapping and killing of the siblings. It's a consistent and ongoing propensity of violence by this man. Even if you consider coming in for non-propensity purposes, kind of goal, what we can show is what he meant to do what he did to old Lisa, shows his opportunity, his intent, his motive. It shows that there was not a mistake here, that it was a very purposeful act, much like what he does to all the other people in his life, with him specifically. It shows his kind of uh, I'm not going to belabor all the testimony. You've heard all the testimony of all of these women, the women that he abused, Denise Frazier Daniel, Elizabeth Reese, Mary Leslie Bryant, his children, Verna, Scotty, Kimberly. They all talked about, two of them talked about last seeing Alyssa, but they all talked about this false exculpatory statement, not just of the kidnapping, but of this alleged brain injury that is just not so. Betty Peters testified. Sarah Krebs testified extensively as of last night searching for the remains. We have not found the remains that has not stopped these investigators from looking for her. Um, Dan, Dan Iverson and Holly Rosen testified as to these DV dynamics. So if there's ever any concern for anybody reading this record as to why Denise did not leave or why Denise stayed or why she kept bringing this child back, I hope that those concerns would be quelled by the testimony, testimony of Holly Rosen. It also seems to put out an explanation of their, why would this man snatch up this child and kill this child? I think Holly Rosen's testimony puts out a perfectly understandable explanation. He could no longer control Denise. He took what he could control. The child that was legally his, he was on the hook for on that birth certificate, but biologically not his. Holly said it perfectly. Batterers are no longer the center of attention. Isaiah Williams was no longer the center of attention. And so he took that child and killed that child. The exhibits the court went through, uh, the medical records were just uh, put into evidence today, but you can see from looking at those records, um, that lack of memory, that amnesia, that is just not so. It's just not corroborated by the records. Um, the family court documents, the birth, mar birth records, marriage records, and all those documentations from De Denise, what those specifically show you, Judge, that in the last 41 years, she has not stopped looking for her child. She has not stopped sending the picture, the information, social security number. So the, the idea that Alyssa could be out there alive, just living her beautiful, perfect life is inconceivable based on even just the efforts of Denise going out there and putting all this information out there. Hundreds of tips have not been fruitful. She is not out there alive. Isaiah Williams, he is born 10, 23, 46. He is not the biological father. He's got a propensity of violence against women. He said he killed her. That is an admission and a confession in which this court can look to and use along with all the rest of the evidence. When that was no longer working, I just don't have a memory. I just can't answer your question. I just don't know who you are. 
Um, these are false exculpatory statements and consciousness of guilt are the material pieces of the evidence that I would ask the court to look to in this case and binding the defendant over on one count of open murder. Um, I reiterate that the lack of a body is just one factor here and one that I believe that we have sufficiently overcome beyond probable cause at this stage. Thank you. Response. I would object to the bind over. Um, it does include a level of premeditation that I don't think is even a question of fact here. We have heard from numerous witnesses and we have seen a number of exhibits. The only thing that was established at a probable cause standard is that Mr. Williams is a bad guy. He's done some bad things. He's been very abusive towards women. Um, he's made threats towards them, he terrorized them for money. But there was no evidence or no testimony about his abusive behavior. In fact, it was the opposite. Um, Ms. Bryant testified that when the baby came over to her house, she and, the, and her two daughters took care of the baby, cleaned the baby up, did the baby's hair, took pictures. She noticed no signs of abuse. The baby didn't seem to be uncomfortable around Mr. Williams. They left. She also indicated that he had given her several stories throughout the years and she didn't believe him. No one believed him because he's known to be a liar. Liars make up multiple reasons and multiple excuses for a lot of different things. We do know that Mr. Williams was money hungry. Um, he had no problems beating up the women in his life to an attempt to get money. So who's to say he did not give his baby away to someone for some money? We don't know and nothing has been proven even at a probable cause standard. Um, if this is bound over, I think it's bound over strictly on character evidence of Mr. Williams being abusive. So because he's an abusive person, he must have abused this child. And I don't think that's a proper standard. So I will object to find over based on that. Just briefly, Your Honor, I yes. ask the court if the court was ever, ever considering that there needed to be premeditation. Look to People v. Johnson, 427 Michigan 8, 107 to 109. It's a 1986 case. People v. Law, B-A-U-T-H, 243 Michigan App. One, page seven, 2000 case, no specification on an open murder charge. I would also say, as far as Mr. Uh, Williams being a liar, that is just more as consciousness of guilt. He cannot keep his story straight. Where is Williams if she is alive? And if you throw out all the other acts, if you separate sitting for the day, not Denise, Denise is part of the case in chief. I would submit to that it's not specific to other acts. Throw out Elizabeth Reese's abuse. Throw up Mary Leslie Bryant's abuse, if you can, if you can separate the strangulation from the confession he gave her, which I don't think you can, it's part of the case in chief. But if you throw that out and just look at everything else, I would submit to the court there is still beyond probable cause to believe that she died at the hands of the defendant, she died of unnatural causes of homicide, and that she is not alive. Um, Your Honor, there is no, I don't know how we can hang our hats on an infant didn't seem uncomfortable or had any bruises in the early weeks of July. Um, if that's not going to be east of that, but we do have evidence that, that he admitted to that he can relate to of a similar, similar age. Thank you.